morning, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to begin reading in verse 19. We're going to read down to verse, verse 25. And then we're going to slip, uh, slip down to verse 36. Reading out of the New Living Translation. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. By his death, Jesus opened uh, a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God can be trusted. Verse 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Go to verse 36. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promise. And all of God's people said, amen. amen at the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Open our hearts to receive and give us ears that would hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Lord, I, I, I pray that we'll leave here today encouraged and strengthened and transformed by the preaching of the word in Christ's name. Amen. The time is now. Do not waver. We're too close to the end. We're too close to the finish line. Do not waver. You'll notice in your notes there's three things we're going to talk about as concerning our passage today. The first is the time is now enter in. And here in the writer of Hebrews talks about the wonderful privilege that we as believers, as we as saints of God have. In verse 19, it says, brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. We can enter in. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the what? Most holy place. So since we have such a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. So whatever you have need of today, Know this, you can bring it to the Lord. You can enter in to the presence of God. This section in chapter 10 of Hebrews begins to unfold the practicality of uh, the books. In essence, what does this new relationship look like? How is this new relationship fleshed out in our daily life? Now, to really understand verse 19, you have to go back to verse 18 and also, or, or verse 14 and verse 18. Verse 14 says this, by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. By that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy, those who are being sanctified. Now, verse 18 and when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. 
So the subject is, our sins have been forgiven, our sins have been removed, and because of this, our sins being forgiven, we have this wonderful privilege to enter into God's most holy place, the presence of the Lord. Write this word. You can enter into his presence with boldness. The writer describes the attitude or the frame of thought that we are to enter heaven's most holy place. Boldness. Boldness describes the new confidence that believers have because this new relationship with the Father. And that Greek word for boldness carries the idea of freedom of speech. It speaks of openness or, or frankness. It speaks of being authentic, being able to have genuine conversation. It speaks of an ability to approach. Today, you can approach God's throne You can bring your needs to him. You can relinquish your cares to him. You can enter in because there is a brand new relationship between you and the father. Now, Now, notice the reason for this dynamic, this new dynamic, is because of the blood of Jesus. The sacrificial life of Christ. The atonement. We just took communion together. We remembered um, the bread, we remember the suffering, the body, and Jesus giving his life for the ransom of many. So this new relationship is not accomplished by animal sacrifices, but by the precious blood of the Son of God. So the blood of Jesus most definitely would accomplish more, and it would change the dynamic of the relationship. Now, the King James uses the phrase, by his flesh. The New Living says, by his death, Jesus opened up the way through the curtain. See, the curtain was the garment which separated the holy place from the most holy place. See, the priest could go into the holy place, but only the high priest could enter the most holy place. The most holy place represented where the Shekinah glory of the Lord fell. That's where the cloud uh, dwelt. It was the the presence of God. And then the high priest could only enter in uh, to that most holy place one time a year. But notice what this new relationship, notice what Jesus accomplished. That curtain has been removed uh, and we can come into the most holy place. Write this under B2. It's a new life-giving way. Notice the contrast. A new life-giving way as opposed to a static annual sacrifice. The way of Jesus is new, life imparting. The life of Jesus imparts life to everyone who comes to him. And this is the great announcement of the New Testament, the new covenant. It's the impartation of life. It's a new way of life operating within you. It's the spirit of the living God. No longer is the is, is the Spirit of God regulated to the temple or the tabernacle. Now every believer becomes the temple of God. And that life-giving Spirit lives and abides and dwells within you. So you can overcome. You will make it through this season. You will be victorious. Why? Because the one who gives life lives and abides and dwells within you. You can make it. So when the enemy tells you you cannot, when the enemy tries to bombard you and to weigh you down, remember there is a new way of life operating within you. The Spirit of God, who himself is life, has taken up residence in your life. Through the curtain into the most holy place, we are brought into the presence of God. 
It's a place of privilege. It's a place of empowerment. It's a place of refreshing. It's a place of freedom. Every day you can come into the presence of God. There are not rituals you have to go through. There's not a system of rules you have to keep. No, you can enter into the presence of God through the name of Jesus. Because the curtain has been torn. The veil has been torn. And now the way of life has been opened to you. Every day, take your needs to the Lord. The time is now. Enter in. You don't have to call the preacher. It's good. You can call the preacher anytime. But the preacher's not the one who gets you into the presence of the Lord. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that's washed away your sins. Aren't you thankful it's not limited to the preacher or to the priest or to the evangelist? You, as a child of God, can enter into that most holy place. It says, because of a great high priest. Look at verse 21. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Write this under C1. Let us go right into the presence of God. Of God. What does the presence of God represent to you? One writer said this We are called upon to come just as we are, but never just as we like. We're to come just as we are, but not just as we like, any old flippant way. Understand. You serve a holy God. You serve a righteous God. He says, be ye holy even as I am holy. But the wonderful news is this. Those who have trusted Christ, his righteousness has been imputed to you. His righteousness has been charged to your account. So you can enter into the presence of the great I am. Now, verse 22, there are certain conditions which must ever mark the sincere worshiper. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from our guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Sincerity is at the heart of this new relationship. How are we to come into the presence of God? With sincere hearts. God's looking for authenticity. God wants the real you. God wants your heart. Your life. It's not some stoic relationship. It's a living new dynamic. You're living it out. You're walking the gospel of Jesus Christ out in your life. How are we to come into the presence of God? With sincere hearts. Sincere hearts are hearts fully trusting him. Our hearts relying upon him. Our hearts in full dependence. Our conscience has been clean. And our bodies are washed with pure water. Listen, your conscience has been clean through the washing of the water of the word of God. As you get the word of God in you, there is a sanctification that takes place. There's a washing that takes place. Your conscience begins to be renewed. Your thought life begins to be renewed. The way you live because it begins to be affected because you cannot live differently than the way you think. But as you take the word of God and that word of God is washing you, that word of God is sanctifying you, there is a, there is a, a holy exchange that has taken place and the spirit of God begins to conform you to the image of God's son. Can you say Amen. I think the essence of this is coming to his presence, not relying upon your own works, accomplishments, or merits, but come in full dependence on the blood of Jesus to cleanse you and to make you right. 
The picture of full dependence is found in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah 66, verse 2. God says, my hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word. I will bless those who what? Have humble, contrite hearts and who tremble. Take the word of God serious. Now is the time, secondly, to be unwavering. The writer of Hebrews says, enter in. He gives us the, the meaning and, and how we can enter into that most holy place. Because in the Jewish mindset, that was off limits. But in this new covenant, you and I, every believer could come into the holy place, the most holy. And now he says, the time is now to be unwavering. Let us hold tightly, verse 23, without wavering to the hope that we of firm. Without what? Without wavering. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. To hold tightly means to hold fast. In the sense of to stick firmly to, to have a firm grip with a refusal to let go. And church, this is so important in the day and age that we are living in. It's important that we hold tightly to the truths of the word of God. It's important that we hold tightly to the promises of the word of God. It's important that we hold tightly to the experiences that we have in Christ. And we're going to see that he's going to go on to talk about not only that God can be trusted in his promises, but this is going to work itself out in how we motivate one another, encourage one another, and how we come together and worship. There's ever been a time that we need to live without wavering. It is now. See, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and gives us right standing with God. Thomas Lee writes this, we are to lay hold of Christ and never let go, even in the slightest. No persecution, real or feared, was to lessen the ardor of these believers for Christ. A great question for us to ask is, am I holding as tight today as I was pre-pandemic? Pandemic? Am I holding tightly to the promises of God today as I was greater than than I was two or three or four years ago. Church, this is a journey. We're on a destination. We're headed into the presence of God, to a new kingdom. And I don't want to get sidetracked. I don't want to let things cause me to waver. I want to hold true to the word of God, to the hope of God that's found in Christ Jesus. And the devil's doing everything he can to get believers to waver in their faith. Do not waver, but hold true. Now, notice the wonderful truth. The encouragement for us not to waver is this. God can be trusted. Did you hear me? God can be trusted. You're going to make it. It may look different when you get to the other side, but hear me, you're going to make it. God can be trusted to keep his promise. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So God can be trusted to keep his word. God can be trusted to keep his oath. Take it to the bank. God is faithful. There's a whole lot of things going on in society today that, that is up and down and it's shifting and changing all around us. But there's one thing that never changes, and that's the presence of God. That's the faithfulness of God. So no matter what comes your way, hold on to God and let his presence keep you. Let his presence draw you closer to him. God is faithful. 
1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. God is faithful. He will not allow the trial to be more than you can stand or bear. Sometimes you feel like you're at the breaking point. Sometimes you feel like, how much more can I take? Hear me. Your God is faithful. Faithful. Write this under C. You got to live it out. You got to live it out. Let me tell you how faith is experienced. We can come up with a bunch of cliches and we can talk real good, but in the day, you got to live it out. You got to live the word of God out. You got to live the promises of God out in your life. It's about living our theology out. It's about allowing the word of God to affect the way we live in our everyday life. This message must affect the way we deal with each other. It must affect the way we approach life and do life with others. So look at verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. Let us not neglect are meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So what is the encouragement? Why should we do these things? Because the day of the Lord is drawing near. Church is getting close. Write this. Let's motivate, let's stir one another up to acts of love. To acts of love. Now, this is an interesting choice of words because of the threat of persecution that these believers were facing. Persecution flows out of hatred. And the writer of Hebrews was challenging his readers to respond in the opposite of hate. He says, respond with love and encourage one another to, to acts of love. Stir each other up. Quit feeding the fire of resentment in one another and start encouraging one another to respond in acts of love. Quit telling your Christian brother or sister, you have a right to be offended. You have a right to be that way. You have a right to act that way. No, you don't. You don't have a right to act and live any way you want. You are called to live through the word of the living God. Encourage one another to acts of love. Encourage them to respond in righteous and holy ways. Encourage them to do the right thing, to acts of love. Notice this, write it under B, also to good works. There's the practicality. It's not just a feeling. It's an action Encourage one another to good works. The book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 14, says he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Totally committed to doing good deeds. I love the New Living Translation. Listen, he gave his life for you. He's freed you from every kind of sin. He's made us his very own people. And it's a people committed to doing good deeds. Doing the right thing. Doing the godly thing. Doing the righteous thing. Our lives have been changed so that we can demonstrate this change Through good works. Don't let the crisis of the moment keep you from doing good today. Instead of of their lives being paralyzed by fear. And I want you to notice in the right in the book of Hebrews, they were under the threat of persecution. They were under the threat of death, of being 
uh, excommunicated, being thrown out of the city, having to, to leave everything familiar and go somewhere else. And listen to what the writer says. Instead of being paralyzed by fear, motivate each other by the good deeds each one is doing. Can I tell you what your presence here today does? It encourages your neighbor. Can I tell you what your presence here today does? It encourages those who are watching. You're living out your faith. The good deeds are following. You are doing the things of God. And I'm here to tell you, it does not go unnoticed. And what we've got to do is we've got to encourage one another. Keep doing good. I know there's the temptation of just becoming lax. There's the temptation of just doing what you want. Don't give in to that temptation. God is faithful. He will help you keep doing the right thing. It's important. Now write this. Do not neglect meeting together. Oh, let's camp out here just for a moment. It's important you get together with other believers. It's important you worship together in community. I tell people I love live stream. I appreciate, but I have a love-hate relationship with live stream. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's a great way of communication today. It's a wonderful way of reaching out beyond our own borders. But it can also breed a level of discontent and a level of continuing in the norm when God's called us to be anything but normal. He's called us to be anything but lackadaisical. We must be together. We need the body of believers I remind you, these individuals were under the threat of death, and they still met together. The last time I met, we don't have authorities coming to lock our doors yet. Thank God. Amen? But you've got to keep meeting together. You've got to keep coming together. You've got to keep worshiping together because it's a place where we are encouraged. It's a place where we are built up. It's a place where we are changed and transformed. We need one another. It's a place where we encourage each other. Hey, you're fighting the good fight. Keep on. It's a place where we encourage others. You're done with sinning. You're done with the old life. You don't live that way anymore. Verse 32 Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember. Remember what Christ has done for you. Remember where he's brought you from. Remember how he changed your life. Point three. The time is now. You need to stay in power. Patient endurance is what you need now. So that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. You hear that? Who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones. Whose souls will be saved. What do you need? Patient endurance. Stamina. Staying power. Patient endurance. Describe a persistence in the face of persecution. A persistence in the face of difficult circumstances. James writes about this in his little book. Chapter 1, verse 2, brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. He says, listen, these things that are happening to you have a spiritual effect on you. 
See, when you lean in, when you encourage one another, when you lean into the activity of God, that trial cannot destroy you. It has to work in your favor. It has to produce godly character in you. Listen to what he says. Your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for your endurance is fully developed. When it is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, staying power comes through leaning and learning to trust God in trials. Some of the benefits of staying power is that they will do the will of God and they'll receive the benefits of God's promises. Hear me, church. You at home, you here today, hear me today. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus is returning. Endure to the end. Allow the trials you're walking through not to discourage you, not to defeat you. Know this, your God is faithful, so lean in to the activity of God. Lean in to what God is doing, and you'll see the Holy Spirit develop patient endurance. You'll see the Holy Spirit is developing you into a stronger Christian, a believer, a saint. Motivate one another to good deeds. Encourage one another to do that which is right. Be faithful to the end because Jesus Christ is coming again. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you because your word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The time is now. God, we can enter in. We can, we can come to the presence of God, bring our needs, bring our frustrations, bring our hurts, bring our pain. God, you encourage us to come into the presence of the Lord with authenticity. There's also a call. The time is now to hold tightly. Lord, the enemy is doing everything he can. The pressures around us are doing everything they can to get us to let go. But the church, the believer, is called to hold tightly without wavering to the things God has set out before us. The time is now for patient endurance. God, I pray for that person, that individual who is feeling the weight of their struggles, who is feeling the weight of the moment. I pray for that person that is on the verge of quitting, of letting go. God, I I hope and I pray today that my words will encourage them to hold tightly I pray that today that the Holy Spirit will remind them of the great contest that we are in. The the loss would be too great, but we're headed to a kingdom. We're going to patiently endure. We're going to fight the fight to the very end. I pray for that one who is struggling to hold on. I pray for the strength, the power of the Holy Spirit to come and encourage them. I pray that other believers will come around them and not chide in with their discontent, but to encourage them to good deeds, to encourage them to lean in, to encourage them to face their fears, to be a part of the assembly the gathering together to let them and remind them to let them know God is faithful. As our head is bowed, our eyes are closed, you might be here in person, you might be home watching via live stream. You're walking through something, you're struggling. I think a part of overcoming that struggle is sometimes admitting Admitting, I need help. I need God. I need the presence of the Holy Spirit to strengthen me. 
you're here today and say, Pastor, I'm walking through some stuff. The pressures are getting to me. I don't want to let go. I want to hold tightly. But I'm struggling today. Will you pray for me? Let me see your hand. You at home, just acknowledge that. Just acknowledge it by putting a like button. Say, pray for me. I want you to know you're going to make it. You're going to overcome. You're victorious. You're here today. Today's the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the time to say, Lord, here's my life. I surrender afresh to you. Maybe you've given in. Maybe you've allowed things to distract you. Maybe your fervency for God today is nothing like it was months ago. The trials have gotten you sidetracked. Today's the day of recommitting. Today's the day of saying, here I am, God. Today's the day of a new beginning. Say, Pastor, pray for me. Lift your hand. You at home just signify by saying, pray for me today. God sees you. Church, let's encourage one another. Let's gather together. Let's worship God in spirit and in truth. Will you stand with me today? You at home, will you stand there in your living room? Turn your home into a sanctuary. You here in person, let's step out from where we are. Let's come down front for a few minutes. Let's make an altar here around the front. God, we need your presence. We need your help. Fill us, God. Empower us. Anoint us.